Hey guys, what's up? My name is Jose and today I want to share with you something that I've been working on for quite a while. So I'm working in Blender 2.8, which was released earlier this year. Originally, I wanted to do a tutorial series, but a great deal of the screen captures I recorded couldn't be used. It was a real bummer, but I decided to instead talk about the project that I'm working on now. The original idea was to create a proxy character that I could reuse and modify to quickly create different character designs. Think of it as a character generator. And so this is what I came up with. I've titled it Convoco, a Spanish word roughly meaning I summon or to conjure. I thought the name was appropriate since in many ways I am summoning these characters from the depths of my mind. Anyways, it's a rigged character that uses several components to quickly modify and animate the proxy mesh. The first component is a rig that stores animation data and pose data. For the most part, this rig is what's going to allow you to animate all of your characters. The second component is a set of shape keys that store the character silhouette. This component is meant to affect the form of the character by using shape keys and drivers to alter the silhouette. And finally, the last component is the proportions rig. This rig controls the scale and size of different features on the character, like the torso or the legs or the arms or the head. So the transform rig uses a combination of bone layers and bone constraints to work with the other components. Basically, the transform rig is separated into four different layers. Think of each layer as its own rig. The bones on the first rig can't be manipulated directly. This rig only stores the bone weights and is the only rig with direct influence on the geometry. All of the bones in this rig are also bendy bones. Ignore the bendy bones looking funny in the viewport. Anyways, the next layer is the forward kinematics layer. All of the bones in the FK rig control the transforms of the bendy bones from the first rig. Then the bones in this rig, the FK rig, are constrained to copy the rotation of the bones in the next layer, called the inverse kinematics layer, or the IK layer. These bones are controlled by IK targets to allow for the quick animation of character limbs, especially legs. The IK bones are then parented to the final layer, called the proportions rig. The bones in this layer control the scale of different features, like the legs, arms, and head. However, you are unable to edit the bones in this layer. The controls driving the scale of these bones exists in a separate rig that I created for organization. I will explain how they work later in the video. The second component is a set of shape keys that store a character's shape. This component would affect the silhouette of characters by using drivers and control bones. You might have encountered the idea that all characters can be broken down into three simple shapes, circles, triangles, and squares. Those shapes oftentimes influence the character's personality. For example, a round character might be seen as cute and friendly, a squarish character might be seen as strong or sturdy, and an angular character might be seen as aggressive or dynamic. I try to represent those three extremes in each of my shape keys, keeping in mind the silhouette of the character above all else. However, I think that in future versions, I will try to really push the shape extremes and stylize them a bit more. In addition to the circle, triangle, and square shape keys, I also created a shape key for the female gender since the base was already male. That brought my total shape keys to 5 if you count the base mesh. Using these five different keys, I could combine them to create various shapes and different characters. In order to deform them, I wanted to create some control bones that could manipulate those values using drivers. Using six different bones, I created a simple rig and I set up a driver for one of the shape keys. I also added a modifier to the driver so that I could get it to behave the way I needed it to. Once that driver was working properly, I copied it to the other shape keys. When doing this, I had to make sure that I was using the correct bones. Be sure to go through each driver and check that the corresponding bones are set as the driver targets. This control setup was pretty neat, but I still wanted a little more control. I duplicated each of the extremes 13 or 15 times, and I created vertex groups that I would use to mask what part of the character the shape keys influence. Using the masks, I isolated each of the individual features, like the leg, or arms, or face. This gave me a lot more control over the shape of my character, which was great because it increased the number of variations I could generate. Of course, now the shape key panel was a mess. This isn't necessarily a problem since I'm using a control rig anyways, but it meant that I was going to have to set up drivers for a lot of shape keys. Drivers can seem intimidating if you're just starting out. 
I mean, I still find them intimidating, but once you get a feel for the basics, you'll see that drivers aren't difficult as much as they are tedious. There are a lot of tiny details you have to pay attention to, and sometimes when you're working with really complicated rigs, that can all get a little confusing and frustrating. It also helps if you know a little bit of algebra. It just helps you understand what each variable in the modifier does and what it looks like on a graph. But if you just pay attention to the guide in the graph editor, you can figure it out pretty easily. The dotted white lines shows you what the input and the output of your drivers are. So I know that when Y is at one or when my driver is at one, I want my control bone to be at the center. And when it's at zero, I want it to be at the edges of the circle. And all I have to do after that is just line it up. And finally, the last component of this rig are the control bones. What's big about these control bones is that they allow you to change the proportions of the character pretty quickly even once you've animated it. The bones from the first component are all constrained to follow the control bones in the third component, or the proportions rig. It's really cool because like I said, it gives you a lot of control and you can make some pretty neat designs when you combine all three of the components together. So this is the complete rig. On the left you have the proxy character and the animation rig and you can pose it and animate the character. And if you decide you don't like your character, you can come over to the right side and you'll see the proportions rig and the silhouette rig. And you can change the character's shape and proportion. Up until now, all I've really done is mess with silhouette and proportion, but there's nothing really that makes these characters unique. And while this is something that I still need to experiment with, I thought maybe the grease pencil could help give each character facial features and some sort of expression. Using the character as a reference, you can get pretty detailed with your designs. However, using this technique, your drawing is on a flat plane while your character is a 3D object. But in the last couple of major releases, the grease pencil has become pretty powerful. It has features that allow you to set the stroke placement. This means that instead of projecting your strokes from the view, you can tell Blender to instead project to a surface. When you draw, your strokes are projected on top of your geometry and they follow the contour of your mesh. If you add a mirror modifier, you can quickly crank out a character's face and other features. I'm a little surprised that I was able to get the hair to look halfway decent like this. Unlike with the view projection, my strokes are a little more haphazard, especially once I got past the face. For the hair in my attempt at clothing, I changed the stroke placement from surface to stroke. Now when I draw, Blender is using the existing strokes as reference to place new ones. This technique is a bit more awkward compared to the first one. However, I think with a little practice and a bit more patience, we can get some pretty neat results. There was a lot I needed to learn and a lot of issues I needed to solve while working on this character generator. But with a whole lot of trial and error, I was able to get something pretty darn close to what I was originally thinking. I can generate characters by altering the mesh silhouette to create a combination of different forms. These characters can be animated and deformed, which is neat, but who cares? What is the point of going through all of this trouble? Was it just for fun? Or was there a point to everything? And the answer is yes, there was definitely a point. When I first started working with Blender, I thought that in order to make my art good, I needed to focus on the technical side of 3D, things like rigging or texturing. I focused so much on learning all of these technical details that I totally neglected the narrative side of art making. I allowed the technical practice to be my only focus, and because of that, everything I worked on never really felt finished. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I've been working on this for quite some time. Before I graduated from high school in 2014, I was bent on writing a story that I could animate, but all my attempts proved unsuccessful. Looking back, the biggest mistake I can point out is that I didn't have the time to plan out what I wanted to animate. I had no idea what story I wanted to tell. I thought that simply having an idea was enough to get started. So that is what I would do. Once I had a vague idea of what I wanted to work on, I jumped straight into 3D. And I found that every time I took this approach, what usually ended up happening is that 27 hours later, I would have an even better idea, and so I would stop what I was doing, and I would scrap the work I had already put in. It was madness. Like, who does that? Eventually, I realized that committing your ideas to writing, in some sense, makes them real. It makes it easier for you to manifest them, if you subscribe to that sort of mindset. Anyways, the point was that I decided to change my approach. For several months now, I've been working on building not only characters and a story, but the world in which they exist. The storyboards that I've been working on have definitely grown to an impressive size, but they are nowhere near the level of quality used in a big studio production. 
this character generator is going to help me change that. Although it's not as polished as I would like, I think that I'm at an excellent place to start. Even at this stage, it helps me establish the overall visuals of the story. It introduces most of the characters, and it gives me a sense of how many locations I will need to plan for later on. Here is a brief introduction to the plot. The story takes place in a time where humanity could still feel the shape of magic. It is an omnipresent force that surrounds every aspect of human life. Humanity is said to have come to this land in the form of giant gods, known as the Kinamitsin. Humans descended from these giants over time, and humanity's godly ancestors perished or faded into slumbering relics. The humans who have settled in this land work to appease the gods so that they may have pleasant dreams as they slumber eternally. But recently, many strange things have started happening that are tipping the world into chaos. People are disappearing, criminal gangs are rampant, and mysterious spirits and creatures have been walking the lands. There are even rumors of the devil himself appearing before people. In the midst of these turbulent times, dark dealings and the supernatural forces threaten the tranquility humanity has enjoyed. Can Santiago and his friends overcome the devil's nightmarish curse for the good of his village? With the character generator now complete, I can use the storyboards as a guide to start designing the characters and laying out different scenes for the animatic. But for now, I want to shy away from going too much into detail with the story. I will definitely go into more detail in later videos. Dang, that was a lot longer than I expected. If you made it this far, congrats. You're still in the running to being America's next top modeler. Icy animation is a medium for storytelling, and it's a medium that should be shared. If you guys are working on any cool stories or projects, let me know. I would love to hear about them. I hope we can help each other grow. If you would like me to go more in depth into how I created the character generator, let me know in the comments below. If there are a lot of people who show some interest, I might take another stab at doing a tutorial series for version 2 of the character generator. If you want to see more of the work I'm doing, be sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.